delighted to have you with us both in person and online on YouTube and for all posterity. So you may be watching this in 2032 and thinking what ridiculous things we were saying about the future. I studies at uh, Oxford University. We're here at the House of European History in Brussels, and this is a joint event between the Europe Stories Project of European history. Let me say straight away that if you're on YouTube, feel free at any time to put comments or questions and they'll reach me here. So we're sitting here in Brussels on Sunday the 8th of May 2022. And tomorrow there will be two big celebrations. Here in Brussels, Europe Day celebrations. In Moscow, Vladimir Putin's Victory Day celebrations. Here, celebrating all the achievements of the European Union. There, Vladimir Putin will be pushing, in whatever form exactly, the big lie that the brutal war of aggression and terror that Russia is fighting in Ukraine is actually a war of denazification. Both these narratives, both these stories, belong here and in our discussion. And actually, what we want to do in our discussion is to try and bring the two together. So let me tell you a little bit about this project. The Europe Stories Project of the Darndorf Program at the European Studies Center at Oxford started in 2018. The first thing we did was to bring together an amazing group of young Europeans uh, who were studying at Oxford from all over Europe, not just the EU. Christian here is from Macedonia. I'm from Britain, which, by the way, is still in Europe, if not in the EU. And we set out to ask what young Europeans want Europe, and particularly the European Union, to do and to be. And we've did, done that in three main ways. First of all, we've done a series of interviews online because of COVID, obviously, right across the continent, asking people a few simple questions like, do you identify as a European? Uh, what was your formative European moment? What do you think is the best European moment in recent European history? What's the worst moment? What's the one big thing you want the EU to do by 2030? And what we found was that for young Europeans, who are young Europeans? Well, for our purposes, people born around or after 1989. We call them the post-89ers. Um, there wasn't one formative moment, like for my generation. It wasn't the Second World War or 1968 or the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was an experience, the experience of freedom of movement both inside Europe and in and out of Europe. And then we did four rounds of representative opinion polling across the EU and in the UK. Very interesting findings. By the way, all of this stuff, the interviews and the findings, you can find on our website, europeanmoments.com. Europeanmoments.com, do take a look. And we found that finding reinforced. Um, 76% of young Europeans said that the European Union would not be worth having without the freedom to travel, study, work, and live elsewhere in the EU. Quite a shocking finding. 53% of young Europeans said that authoritarian countries are better equipped than democracies to tackle the climate crisis. And then the third thing we did was to narrowed down on a few big themes, freedom of movement, uh, climate change, social Europe, democracy, Europe in the world, and dig deeper in webinars in our own research. This produced a report, Young Europeans Speak to EU. For those of you who are here, it's here physically. Uh, online, you can find it on europeanmoments.com. And what we're going to do in this hour here is to focus on two subjects, uh, climate change and social Europe, 
and then have a response in the light of the war in Ukraine, because of course, the war in Ukraine puts into question the whole framing of our results. Maybe actually the war in Ukraine is the formative moment for young Europeans. Maybe it changes all our priorities. So Christian Fedanovsky sitting here on my right from Macedonia, doing a doctorate in social policy at Oxford, is gonna talk about social Europe. Uh, Anna Martins from Portugal over there, did the MPhil with us at, uh, at Oxford, now working with the Catholic University of Lisbon and also with a think tank for a new liberal party. Uh, in Portugal, we'll talk about green Europe. And then Mani Howlett over here, who did her doctorate at uh, LSE on Ukraine, specifically on Ukraine, uh, is now a departmental lecturer with us at Oxford. We'll be talking about Ukraine and perhaps as post-Soviet space more broadly, what young Europeans there think about it, how that changes the way we think about the future of Europe. They're each gonna talk for about seven minutes and then we'll go straight into discussion. So without more ado, Christian, social Europe. Thank you, Timothy. Um, I think we had a very easy job, those of us who wrote uh, the social policy chapter of the report, because social policy, um, and it was me and my colleague Guillaume Bogam, also doing a doctorate at Oxford, um, because social policy is really constantly on the mind of many young Europeans, but also European citizens more broadly, and European politicians. So for example, we have Emmanuel Macron saying that Europe is where social policy was created. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen would say, in Europe, the dignity of work must be sacred. But all these proclamations, um, until recently, rang quite hollow, we would argue. But then, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic happened, and social policy uh, returned to the forefront. Um, COVID-19 constitutes a major point of discontinuity in this regard. We're not sure yet if it will uh, become a permanent trend, if it will constitute a reversal. Uh, and however, it's very important to highlight the two major initiatives in terms of social policy that uh, the European Union introduced as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first one is certainly the SURE initiative, support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency. Uh, we elaborate on it in a lot of detail in the report. 100 billion euros have been allocated for this purpose. And then the second major initiative, REACT EU, uh, over 6% of the Next Generation Recovery Fund was dedicated uh, to financing education and job training, uh, the so-called active labor market policies, which might um, constitute the future of social policy making. And of course, at the EU level, there is still not a lot of social policy. Social policy remains very much a national level prerogative. Um, some individual states in the EU uh, spend up to a third of their national budgets on social policy. The EU spending is nowhere near that level, but there has definitely been an upward trend in recent years, mainly as a result of, of the pandemic. Now, I think the real added value of our report is not about you know, summarizing the major initiatives of the EU. Um, I presume many in the audience will already be familiar with that. What we tried to bring to the table is um, our polling um, data and our findings point to a, a lot of salience for social policy among uh, young Europeans. As you will hear a lot, I guess, uh, throughout the day, uh, our polling data were mainly targeted at uh, young Europeans from the age of 16 to, to 29. And um, one very interesting statistic, for example, is that young people are more young Europeans are more concerned about job insecurity, according to our data, than Europeans over 46, even though many young Europeans obviously don't work yet. Poverty and unemployment are among the three key concerns for over half of young Europeans. Uh, there are some peculiar aspects there, such as the fact that uh, young Europeans are more likely to list gender equality and minority rights as social policy concerns, whereas older Europeans might not necessarily see them that way. 
Uh, I think it's also interesting that there were some differences within our category of young Europeans. So uh, for the very young Europeans, up to the age of 24, uh, education and especially the environment were even more salient than social policy. But overall, social policy and the very idea of social Europe did emerge as very significant for, for young Europeans. Now, based on this, it seems that young Europeans would welcome the initiatives that I, that I mentioned earlier that the EU has been undertaking, but they would also like the EU and their national states, of course, uh, to do more about social policy. So our polling has revealed, and this is very consistent with other polling sources on the matter, which we also used in the report, such as the Eurobarometer and the European Social Survey, uh, young Europeans are even more likely than the general population uh, to support the introduction of a universal basic income, for example, at, at the EU level. And um, they're also likely, more likely to support more redistribution from richer to poorer EU member states. And 84% of them are in favor of the EU obligating member states to introduce uh, national level minimum wages. So uh, in conclusion, I don't want to take, take up too much time, uh, but I just wanted to highlight that, of course, given the current context and the war in Ukraine, uh, social policy <clears throat> might lose in salience. Um, and there is this aspect that I mentioned that the environment might be uh, even more important for the very young. But overall, social policy, very important for young Europeans. And if there is one takeaway from the previous big crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, is that we've, we've finally had this long overdue recognition of the importance of social policy, an unprecedented outpouring of social policy action, including at the EU level. So now, now it only remains to be seen whether um, in times of normalcy, once those finally occur, whether social policy will retain its very high status uh, in European policymaking. That's fantastic, Christian. Thanks very much. Quick question, remind us how many people supported universal basic income? Um, I don't have the exact figure right now, but it's, it's definitely um, a high number. I think While I, we're speaking, I can, I can look it up. I think I do, because I think I think. have it here. <laughs> um, let me just, uh, there we are. 71% of all Europeans, this is not just young Europeans, believe the state should give all citizens a basic income. That's a pretty striking finding. I mean, one has to say, just to pick up the point that Christian was making, that that was a finding from March 2020. So it was just at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So one has to allow for that. But even so, it's a pretty striking finding. Um, great, thanks so much, Christian. Anna. Okay, so there are many important findings uh, that came out of our project. Um, and I, I think I can say that perhaps two of them were more salient, uh, at least in terms of indicating what are the clear priorities for Europeans, including young Europeans. One has already been mentioned by Timothy, which is that three quarters, three quarters of Europeans believe that the EU would not be worth having without freedom of movement. And the other one was that most Europeans want a carbon neutral Europe, uh, sorry, EU, um, by 2030, but that would include Europe as well. Um, and uh, to be more precise, that's 58% of Europeans who said by 2030, and then an additional 20% by 2040. Um, and so contrary to the general perception that this is mostly a young Europeans concern, the climate, the environment, we found that this was a cross-generational con concern. There was no real difference among generations. Um, about how important um, this um, aim is for all Euro Europeans. Um, what was, wh wh where we did find differences was really how to approach um, the solutions to climate change, uh, how to tackle it. Um, and so for example, young Europeans are more inclined towards solutions like um, governments imposing a carbon tax uh, to transition away from fossil fuels, or retraining programs for fossil fuel employees. Um, whereas older Europeans tend to prefer subsidizing renewable energy um, and that type of solution. Also young Europeans are more open than uh, older generations to accepting restrictions 
Um, one example of that is uh, dietary choices. So two thirds of Europeans are willing to have their diets restricted to vegetarian or vegan uh, choices in public eating facilities, not the overall diet, but in public eating facilities. Um, so these are the kinds of uh, differences that we found among generations with regard to climate change. Um, it's more focused on the solution, not exactly on recognizing the problem, which is broadly recognized across generations. Um, one of the most striking results we've had, though, and we, it was kind of a challenge to interpret, and that Timothy has already also mentioned, um, is that 53% of Europeans uh, believe that uh, authoritarian states are better equipped at tackling uh, climate change than democracies. And this is uh, a, a really striking finding, um, especially when we try to square it with what we know about young Europeans valuing uh, the core democratic and liberal values um, that are at the base of um, the EU, the basis of the EU. So, uh, and we know this, this is confirmed. Uh, Sophie will uh, address this later in our democracy chapter. These are clear values that young Europeans have. So how, how can we make sense of this result? Especially considering that there's really no good example of an authoritarian state tackling climate change successfully. Actually, the only progress you can see is from democracies uh, that are both already reducing carbon emissions and also pushing the rest of the world towards uh, um, less carbon emissions. So um, how did we make sense of this? Well, also considering other um, findings that Sophie will address later, um, it seems to indicate the level of frustration with democratic performance or the, the performance of democratic institutions when tackling a crisis like this. Um, and this resonates with um, a f one of our findings uh, more with regard to, to democracy, which is young Europeans tend to, per to uh, evaluate um, the EU more based on performance than on procedure. So where, as compared to an older generation. Um, so, and now if we consider that whilst we were doing this project, another crisis happened, which was a pandemic, and that was very much reflected in the results we had in our interviews. When we asked, for example, what was the worst moment in recent European history, many people started to answer it was a pandemic. Um, and now we're having another crisis after we've concluded this project. And as you've also highlighted, I mean, uh, We'd probably, and, and I, I, I suspect that we might get a, a, an inkling of that when we, when we uh, know of the results here um, of the interviewees who will answer these questions. Um, so we've seen, young Europeans have seen the EU address two crises very, with, with a, a great sense of urgency and very effectively. There were problems around the, along the way. There was uh, some, disappoint, some disappointment with the vaccine rollout and so on. But overall, the EU, there's no question that the EU worked, uh, uh, found a solution, worked fast. And I think the greatest proof of that was really how it addressed the Ukraine or is addressing the crisis in Ukraine. And so again, with climate change, we see progress, very slow progress. And now, uh, whereas before these two crises, we could say, oh, the problem is that the EU is very bureaucratic and, and is very slow moving. But no, we've just seen that the EU can be very quick moving. So this, I think, uh, uh, um, reignites the question, why uh, is there not more uh, progress and a sense of urgency, a greater sense of urgency, as is reflected by the opinions of most Europeans across all generations? I would just like to end with a note, since this is a social and green panel, and join the two topics because they're obviously related. Um, I'm originally from the Azores, I was born there, uh, and the Azores were once the poorest region in Europe. Um, and if it weren't for transportation, it's in the middle of the Atlantic, um, we wouldn't have uh, developed uh, to the point we are now. Also, uh, uh, greatly thanks to EU funding, um, there's, there's the airports there, uh, I don't know, many public, public buildings um, have the uh, EU plaque saying that uh, they were EU funded. Um, 
But beyond that, I mean, without uh, means of transportation, there's just no way a region like that could develop. So there, is these, there are these two um, ideals in tension. Um, and uh, I should mention that we, one of the solutions we propose uh, for climate change is to ban short uh, haul flights in Europe, so long as there is an alternative a tra uh, where, uh, whereby one can travel by train within 12, 12 hours. So if that alternative is there, then we think that uh, short haul flights should be banned. So that would exclude obviously the case of the Azores until we have a better and more environmentally friendly solution for people to travel there. And I'll give the floor back to Timothy and thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. And so one of these days we'll have the train from the Azores and then, and then we will, you won't have to fly. Um, the very interesting point about crisis, one thing we might want to discuss is, you know, the, 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 the sort of the really slightly hackneyed old theory that European integration always advances through crisis. Actually, a more nuanced view is that it advances through some crises. And the more interesting question is, what kinds of crises actually promoted integration and why. The COVID crisis, as you both agreed, did. We'll come on to discuss in the next session, but something maybe starting now, whether the, the Ukraine crisis did that. Let me, before going over to Marnie, just say, if any of you have not given us an interview, there is a most amazing self-recording interview booth just over here and we would strongly encourage you, please, to go and record your own interview and tell us what was your formative moment and best moment and worst moment. That would be great, and, and it will then go online. Thanks again, Anna. Mani. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, everyone, for welcoming here. Um, I want to begin by saying that I was not part of this project. Um, I study Ukraine. I'm a political scientist uh, who did my PhD in Ukraine, but my family ties um, also uh, go back to Ukraine. So with this, I'm not technically European. I'm actually a Canadian. Uh, and so I, with this and sort of with this lens, I do want to speak about, um, you know, how the world sees the EU, I suppose, and where the EU goes uh, forward with the crisis happening in Ukraine, um, using my expertise, but also, um, I guess, more in a geographical position uh, where I'm situated within it. Uh, the most interesting is that while I was not part of this project, my research is quite similar to what was uh, the findings and in fact um, some of the methods that I used and in fact some of the observations I found on the ground during my doctoral research in Ukraine align quite closely. Uh, so one question that I asked people of all ages when I did my ethnographic field work in Ukraine uh, just up prior to uh, the pandemic, so up until March 2020, was how do they identify? And this was not a specific question they could identify in any way. And more often than not, individuals first and foremost said that they identify as European. This, there was variety, uh, specifically you know, where I was at the time in Western Ukraine. Um, we know that people would be more willing to identify as European, but this was even true in some of the regions that have been in the news most recently. Uh, Chernihiv in particular is a region that I've studied uh, and lived in quite extensively, and individuals there of all ages, first and foremost, um, identified as European, and then as a Ukrainian, and then as a citizen of their uh, more specific city or their locale in which they're situated. So for me, this raises some really important questions. Um, had we, I done this research perhaps in 2014 or even prior to the Euromaidan, um, closer to Ukraine's independence, the results might have been very different. Um, and we can't necessarily run these results right now to know how people, or run the same a study to know how people would identify. But I think it's quite telling as to where Ukrainians place themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe or within Europe, I guess we could say. Um, in addition to identifying as European, uh, another important finding which aligns much of what I've read in the report uh, is that young, European, or young Ukrainians in particular uh, really saw a future uh, with green energy and to moving towards more environmentally friendly practices. Uh, this is not um, at the same extent to which we're seeing in the EU where it's more, um, more collective uh, democratic policies uh, coming into place, but more just a desire of the people to move in that direction. So incorporating or putting a greater emphasis on recycling practices, thinking more about ways uh, that Ukraine could develop um, some of their garbage um, distribution or I guess collection practices, moving towards a more uh, progressive um, way in which we approach the environment. Uh, in addition to this, uh, social policy, like uh, my colleague here has mentioned, 
um, the desire for a higher pay, a higher standard of living, and to just improve social services uh, more generally was also a desire of the young people wanting uh, their country to progress uh, forward. Um, interesting, this aligns very much of what we, we see in the report, um, and so did the identifications of the people. Um, but yet, as we know, Ukraine is not and has not been part of the EU. So there is a question here, and how do they place themselves? How do we see them? Um, and I think, uh, for me, just arriving in Brussels yesterday and seeing a Ukrainian flag placed between two European Union flags um, just outside of the station, um, right by outside the European Commission, for me shows, I mean, that perhaps the Europeans see Ukraine as part of themselves as well. Um, although we know that uh, the neighbor on the other side of the country does not feel the same way, but this is an important finding and something I think that can di guide much of our uh, discussion um, going forward. Uh, but one thing that I thought was also quite interesting that came up in the report was uh, you know, the question of what is the EU. So when it was founded, we know that it was more of an economic um, um, institution. However, with Brexit um, and as it develops itself with uh, the current global climate, um, it has become more, at least what was brought up or how I read the report, is it's become also about these social values, whether they be about um, certain demo democratic values, the environment, different social policies. Um, these values are really important. Um, and I think right now in the contemporary day, we have to ask ourselves what specifically are these values in which the the organization is representing, what are they founded on, uh, what were they founded on, what are they, and what will they be going forward. Um, if we're going to talk about democracy, freedom, freedom of speech, um, human rights, um, I think we all could um, advocate and we could really uh, forcefully say that Ukraine has demonstrated this uh, quite fiercely uh, within the last three months. Um, so if it is about these values, where does Ukraine then fit? If they identify as Ukrainian, or sorry, as European, uh, they, they uphold these same values and they have a very similar idea about the future for their country. Um, just wrapping it up though, because I, I imagine we have plenty to talk about here. Um, I want to leave us with some questions and just thinking about you know, what it is um, what it is that Ukraine has in its mind, uh, what the EU represents, uh, what does the EU have in its mind as uh, what Ukraine represents. Um, and as we see Ukrainians um, fighting for these same values that have come up in the report, I think maybe the, the most important question we could ask ourselves is uh, whether Ukraine perhaps has a better idea of what the direction of the EU should look like going forward and uh, perhaps bringing in those perspectives would be uh, perhaps interesting in terms of how we understand the EU's role uh, both right now as well as into the future. Thank you very much, Marnie. A couple of quick questions. First of all, did you ask in your polling, which was March 2020, you say? Uh, my ethnographic research ended up at March 2020. It's a similar time yeah, to our yeah, first yeah. round. Did you ask about support for EU membership? So I didn't explicitly, but yet yeah. individuals could continuously bring it up. Right. Um, and in, it was often cited that individual young people, uh, speaking of freedom of movement, want to go to the EU. And I think the most important quote I was speaking with my colleague earlier was that people reference they want to go to the EU because they love their country, but their country doesn't love them. So they wanted to leave because it offered something better. So that raises a really interesting point, which is uh, Ukrainians have had visa-free travel since 2017. And as we know from the experience of quite a few countries in the EU, it's very often the individual choice for Europe. So the famous line, it's easier to change countries than to change your own country. So there's a danger that as a, so to speak, those who are pro-European go to Europe being somewhere else and rather than their own country becoming more um, in accordance with those values. The other thing I did want to ask you, Mani, because we talked about it last night is, you're just about to do another round of polling? That sounds so fascinating. The idea of doing public opinion polling in Ukraine today is just so fascinating. Could you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, so um, a colleague and I at Oxford have just recently started, um, two days ago, the first polls have gone out, um, working with a think tank in Ukraine, um, repeating some polls that were run in February 2021 and December 2021 as the increased tensions uh, were arising with Russia. So we've, re we've replicated a, a very similar survey, um, and many of the questions center on um, economic concerns and security concerns for Ukraine and where individuals uh, see their country going as well as where they place it. Um, going forward, we also have, would like to repeat this survey and run this over several months and to understand understandings of peace and how people perceive peace, what might 
what might peace look like, um, but also beyond that, um, what would be the best situation geo uh, geopolitically for their state. Fascinating. That's going to be so interesting. Um, let, let's make this interactive. Do a straw poll. Um, I'm going to put you all on the spot, so be ready. <laughs> Who thinks that the EU should accept Ukraine as a candidate for EU membership? Hands up. That's fairly near unanimity. I don't know. I think, uh, Jolt, you were slightly skeptical, or was that a hand up? Or Completely skeptical or complete? Ah, it's complicated. Please, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's uh, yes or no. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself or and telling us where you're from. Yeah, yeah. I'm George. I'm uh, uh, working at the Commission right now as a trainee, so new here. And yeah, it, it, it's a very convoluted matter. Um, say a bit more about the complication. It's a convoluted matter. I don't think it's a yes or no. Right? Um, integration can take place at many different levels. Uh, this is how Europe has been working anyway. And um, it's not all in or all out for any country in Europe, I think. Right. So I think this is going to be a key subject for the conversation over the next weeks and months. I mean, as you know, it's gone to the Commission for a recommendation, and then it's coming back to the European Council, I believe, in June. Um, would anyone else like to come in on that? Would anyone on the panel? Yeah, Christian. Yes, I mean, it's a topic that I've thought about a lot since I come from a country which is currently a, a candidate member, uh, North Macedonia. Uh, North Macedonia has been a candidate member since 2005, uh, which probably goes to show that just becoming a candidate member doesn't really mean much, uh, although I do definitely support uh, the notion. Of course, we should also be careful to make sure that the credibility of uh, becoming a candidate member and the EU accession process as a whole is not undermined as a result of, a, you know, of an accelerated or you know, political decision. But uh, the criteria are, are actually set relatively low for candidate member status, so it should be feasible for Ukraine to, to achieve that in the near future. So if the political will is there, I think we should all be supportive of it. So, I mean, my question, and I do put your hand up if anyone else would like to come in on this. Many people I know, colleagues and friends, who are very sympathetic to Ukraine say, well, not full EU membership, but maybe partial or sectoral EU membership. My concern is that the, the incentive structure is not right, both for the Ukraine and for the EU to actually move forward down that path, unless at the end of the day, they know they have a real chance of being a member of the European Union, and the European Union knows that this country is going to be a member. So we've got to get serious about it. So the Macedonian experience is, is a very interesting one, because at a certain point, people in Macedonia might turn around and say, well, you're not serious about it. You and the EU, I mean, how long is it? 17, 17 years? years? 17 years. How long do we have to wait? Um, and then both sides turn away from it. So would anyone else like to come in on the, Jan, yeah. Um, perhaps you could introduce yourself too. Well, Jan Farfall, member of the team. Uh, we talked about Northern Macedonia, but then another case study might be Serbia. So once again, in Western Balkans, obviously the conflict in Ukraine is, is, is now under the process, and we don't know how will it end and in what ways, whether it will end in a peace settlement or in the frozen conflict. But uh, if in a very you know, unfortunate situation we see Ukraine losing part of its territory, towards Russia, how do we reconcile this with the prospect of accession? Because like one case study relatable to this is Serbia and the ongoing tensions with Kosovo that are stalling the talks for even more than 17 years. So this is another case very while. have Lena from uh, uh, Kiev with us here, so I'd come to you at any point you'd like to. But maybe, can I give, give that to Mani? How would you respond to that? I don't know how to speak on that, to be honest. I think it is complex. I, I think I don't know how 
I guess it depends where the EU stands on it too. What is the EU willing to take on at this time? Um, I'm not sure, I mean, you could maybe speak to it, but the history, have we seen an instance like this where there's a country in distress that we need to bring in? Will that, will that solve some of the issues? What, how do we rebuild the country at this time? And if, do we wait until the frozen conflict or if, there, if the conflict is frozen, if there is peace, what does peace look like? There's so many, there's so many moving parts and I, I don't know how to speak about. So, so, so let me maybe pick it up because I think yeah. it's such an important question. Yeah. So, so, so here's the thing. As we sit here, there is the largest war in Europe since 1945 going on. A terrible war is going on in a country which has suffered just horribly over the last 100 years. So that, that needs to be set up front and the war is still very hot indeed. If at some point you move from war to what has been called hot deadlock, which is where you've almost got to a stalemate, which is entirely possible because it's the might of the Russian army, but that hasn't been as effective as many people thought it would be against the incredible courage and skill of the, of the Ukrainian resistance plus the defense industry of the West. And that combination up against the Russia. So it's, it's possible that at some point, nobody knows along what line, if you assume that gradually cools down, so you cool from a hot to a frozen conflict, and there's a line. Yeah. And let, let's assume, I don't think there'd be a peace deal, but maybe there are UN peacekeepers along that line. Then the question becomes, is it impossible to imagine the EU taking in such a country? And the answer is clearly, it's not impossible because we've done it. Anyone remember Cyprus? We took in a country which has a frozen conflict and the small quote unquote breakaway part is tied to a large authoritarian and to some extent hostile power. So it's an almost exact analogy, certainly for Moldova, where, where you have a frozen conflict in Transnistria. Uh, and by the way, Germany was a frozen conflict for a quarter century after 1945 until uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany and East Germany were recognized internationally in the early 1970s. So it's nonsense to say that we cannot take a country with a genuinely frozen conflict into the EU. There are many other. So I, I, think, I think it's important to say um, what Christian said, which is we mustn't weaken the criteria. It must be rigorous conditionality, but in itself, Jan, unless you want to come back on this, the fact of having a frozen conflict is, I think, not an insuperable obstacle. Yeah. Jan, do you want to? I mean, certainly uh, the case study of, of, of Cyprus is a good example when we are willing and, and prepared to take a country with a frozen conflict, but uh, there are some major differences between Turkey and Russia that we also need to take into consideration. So Turkey being in NATO, Turkey not possess possessing a nuclear armament is a, a, a big factor in it. But I fully agree that uh, the way forward would be to muscle our strengths towards finding a feasible solution to integrate Ukraine. And uh, it might become part of an agenda that would reinvigorate the European project. So, and if I may just pick up on that quickly, which is, of course, and, and do jump in, please, but, but um, it, people saying identical things often actually mean something very different. So we might say there are these genuine difficulties. There are going to be an awful lot of people in the EU who say exactly the same thing, but what they actually mean is we don't want to enlarge the EU any further because there are an awful lot of people, particularly in Western and Southern Europe, who think actually don't want further enlargement or who indeed think it has enlarged too far already, right? And that includes some very significant member states. So that's worth, worth having in mind. Um, uh, Mani. Uh, you also raise a really interesting point about NATO too. And so I think, you know, what is the role of oh. if the EU were to enlarge, right? Where does NATO fit in this? And if it is a frozen conflict, and Ukraine would need some sort of support, I mean, militarily, whether this be peacekeepers on the ground. 
um, or some other support to help them out. And I don't think that's the EU's job to do so. So I think we're, we're sort of asking two questions, or you're highlighting two really important geopolitical entities that need to play a role and redefine how Ukraine fits in relation to them going forward, whether it be a full member in either or some sort of tangential member where they play a role. Because as we're seeing, I mean, Ukrainians are willing to fight for their country, but they do need support in some capacity, officially um, or unofficially, but they do need that support. No, that's the point. Liliana, please, if you could just introduce yourself for the rest. Thanks. So my name is Lilia, and I'm Ukrainian. I am the Young European Ambassadors in Ukraine coordinator, and I work for some other European projects. So actually, um, indeed, on the one hand, we should consider first and foremost the um, desire and readiness of the EU to accept the countries, new countries, but uh, if you consider whether the country actually can join the EU, we also need to consider the country itself. And when we talk about Ukraine, the last polling, which was done in, uh, at the end of March, shows that 91% of Ukrainians would like to join the EU, which means that if you have almost 100% of population who are willing to join the EU, it means that the country will be doing all what is required from it to actually follow the requirements and to be um, successful in that not to become one of the uh, of those countries uh, well on which we recommend that they were not ready to join the EU or that uh, we accepted them you accepted them too early uh, also if we get back to that uh, report and to that pooling you might see that the desire of people to join the EU is uh, rising while the desire to join NATO is falling down uh, which is also an interesting uh, point, and we also need to consider that. But if talking about the EU, that is crucial. If people are ready, Ukrainian people are ready and willing to join it, it means that they will not be, uh, you know, having these uh, bad marks in doing their home job. Lilia, if I may, since when is the uh, uh, is the line of support for joining NATO? going down and that for EU going up. Oh. Yes, I can actually check it. So um, the last report is dated on the 5th of April. Well, the report I saw actually. And uh, it is written there so that in, uh, during the first days of the war, the support of joining the NATO uh, was growing from uh, 62 until to, uh, to 76. But after that, in the next uh, uh, few weeks, it was going down. So okay. when the war began, we had this rise of the people willing to join NATO, but then with the development of the process, with all the, we see in Ukraine, with all that, um, you know, I cannot even name it like war actions, it's something inhuman, the desire to join NATO is also falling down, but to join EU is rising. And, and do you interpret that as being because people no longer believe that there's a serious chance of joining NATO, what Zelensky said at one point? I would say that people now have seen that Ukraine is so strong itself that even if uh, some big alliances are not ready to support us on the ground, uh, we will win even without these big alliances being actually there. Got Thank you very much, Lilia. That was fantastic. Uh, let me just remind people who are online that you can put questions on the YouTube thread and they'll reach me by some means or other. Sophie. Um, I was wondering, because we were talking about this question of enlargement and enlargement fatigue and the fact that some countries have been candidate countries uh, for so long, so there is this disbelief that uh, joining the EU is actually possible or is it going to change anything? Um, so I wonder if, if enlargement is not going to be any more on the agenda, if it's not going to be relevant anymore, if it's not going to be effective anymore, what is the future of the EU 
how is the EU going to stay relevant um, on the regional scene and on the global scene if enlargement is not anymore this number one tool that it had to promote its values and its interests? So, so what's, 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 what, what are the other options that we have? I think it's a great question. Christian, do you want to start on that and then I might add something? Yes, I mean, we definitely have to be careful, first of all, about how we talk about Europe, really. Because when we say young Europeans, for example, all of us, I include myself here, when I talk about the report, I talk about young Europeans, but I'm really talking about young citizens of the EU, because that's where we, we conducted our, our polling. Um, it's difficult for me not to include my own country and the Western Balkans in that category, even though geographically, culturally, even politically, you could argue, we certainly uh, belong there. I think the point about public opinion is very important. The fact that uh, there is overwhelming support among the Ukrainian population for um, accession. I think uh, we should separate the conversation about the actual political or even legal technicalities of the accession process from the very decision to strategically invest in this journey. It's not going to happen immediately. It hasn't happened quickly for any country. But it's all about our uh, principal decision to consider um, countries which feel European, which have overwhelming support for, for this political step to, to allow them the opportunity to, to become part of, of the EU. Because otherwise, the, the whole idea of, of a Europe whole and free uh, will be undermined. But aren't your friends in becoming disillusioned after 17 years? I'm astonished and positively impressed, obviously, uh, by <laughs> how high support for, for EU membership has, has remained uh, in North Macedonia. It's still in the 70s, probably, 70-something percent. Very high, it was even higher than that. Of course, it's fluctuating. When, when Macron starts objecting, it goes down, and then when Bulgaria starts objecting again, it goes down again. <laughs> but people have been relatively resilient, and it's not just North Macedonia. In most of, of the Western Balkans, there is still overwhelming support for, for a year of session. Yeah, I mean, this is a really important point because if we start thinking about a strategy for the next 10, 20 years, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, eventually Belarus, then you can't ignore the Western Balkans, so that it, 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 it becomes absurd to say that North Macedonia has to wait another 10 years because we're going to take in Moldova. So one has to think of a whole new wave of, of enlargement. To, to the great question, Sophie, um, you, know, you know, one answer to that is, is Vucic. So uh, Vucic in Serbia, President Vucic, says, OK, we're not getting into the EU anytime soon, so I'm going to play all sides. I'm going to have great relations with the EU, but I'm going to get whatever I can from Russia and whatever I can from China. And so from our European point of view, that's a problem if we have a whole set of countries here who, with a rising China and aggressive Russia, are playing each off against the other. So I think we actually have a, we, I still say we, the EU, have a geostrategic interest in, in, in keeping the belief in enlargement online. Anna, did you want to come in on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, very quickly, I, I don't really have that much to add to what has been said, uh, but I was thinking just that. I mean, what would be the alternative, kind of like in line with your question? What, I mean, if we don't take Ukraine in, um, what, what lies ahead? Uh, for me, I mean, I think uh, accept uh, the, the candidate status for me is an obvious step. I don't really see <coughs> why we shouldn't go there. Obviously, I think we should be rigorous with the criteria for accession, and especially taking into consideration that there are other countries in line, and it, it wouldn't be a good look to put Ukraine ahead of them. Um, so, but yeah, the, to me, that question that you just raised um, perhaps should figure more in the debate that we're having right now. What would the alternative really look like so if we I don't do this? I think this is a great point, and, and seen if I may speak as a moment as an honorary Central European, um, seen from Central and Eastern Europe, there's going to be a lot of skepticism about any proposal that comes from EU member states of some sort of long-term alternative to EU membership. Because if you remember, there's a whole history going back to François Mitterrand's proposal for a European Confederation in 1990-91 which essentially is saying, here's a lovely waiting room 
and you Central and East Europeans can wait a long, long time in the waiting room while we proper West Europeans go on having the real thing. So I think you know, it's going to be very difficult to come up with an alternative which is, which is credible. Um, Sophie, did you want to come back on this? Yeah, I, I mean, because for now what I, what I see is that we have this membership perspective which is not working, which is, which is also not effective anymore because we lose the credibility of, of having that membership perspective being an effective tool. So, and I also feel like it's ethically wrong to say, oh, yes, you will join one day. You have to keep the belief that you will yeah. join, but actually we will never give it to you. And then at the other, on the other side, the other option that there is right now, which is a partnership, a lot of like, yes, it's, it's not that easy. It's not yes or no, you can have a little bit of in between, but that's, that's what was already in place. There was an inter Eastern partnership. There was a lot going on and that clearly was not enough. So I feel like the two options we have on the table at the moment, yeah, neither of them are really uh, effective or credible anymore. So I think it, brings everything back to one of the questions we had yesterday at, at dinner that, you know, wh what is this union really about? Is it about this economic union or is it about the values? And, and how can we move forward thinking about that? How can we really make this happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, sorry, did you want to come in on? Uh, very quickly, uh, I think this is a defining moment for that because as you were, you were no. saying, um, the uh, crises have, you know, the paradigm shift effect. They uh, create momentum for things that would otherwise be stagnated for ages and just, you know, being discussed in academia uh, and, and no more than that. Christian. Yeah, for one very specific recommendation that we can make perhaps on, on, on the question of enlargement, uh, we should really reconsider uh, the role of unanimity in the EU enlargement process, mm -hmm. the fact that yeah all EU member states have to agree on almost every single milestone in the accession process. Currently, that's a problem for North Macedonia given our ongoing dispute with Bulgaria. So formally, there is only one individual member state which is keeping the entire process hostage. Uh, it might happen for, for Ukraine tomorrow. All, all it will take for, for Vladimir Putin to try to sabotage that process is to find one mm -hmm. individual member state which would be willing to, to play that role of a spoiler, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point, and Viktor Orban might be all too willing to oblige. Yeah, Liliana. Thanks, so actually I would like to pick up on a sport that uh, today is the formative moment of understanding whether European Union is about economy or about values. And as I mentioned, there are 91% of Ukrainians supporting the accession to the EU, but for them it is now about values. For, ne for them it is now not about uh, so much economy or some other issues, but about values, about actually claiming and stating, um, establishing themselves as people living a, in a democratic state with the uh, institutions in place which protect human rights, uh, which do not allow the authoritarianism to actually spread over the country and uh, which have the freedoms. And in this context, I mean the freedom and the, the right to life included in that. So for Ukrainians now, it is about values. Lilia, thanks very much. And we, our next section is on democracy and freedom. We're just gonna have to wrap up. Um, I'll come to you in a minute, Jan, but uh, let me just double check if there's anyone in the rest of the room who would like, the lady behind you, yeah. If you could just introduce yourself. Yes, yeah. hi, I'm uh, Laura. Um, thank you for, for your panel. And uh, I'd like to go back to the climate question because I found it quite interesting that uh, you said that the climate concerns are cross-generational and at the same time that you ask what are the crises that make Europe move faster uh -huh. with more unity and more action. And then I wonder, so the perception I have is that maybe this crisis in Ukraine is making more for changing climate policy in terms of energy, energy consumption than it was ever made. So suddenly there's a crisis going on a war to mouth, and there's more being done when the, it was actually already a concern for many, many people from different generations. So I'd like you to comment on that. 
brilliant. I, l let's collect a few questions and then do a last round because we're just coming up to the end of time. Of course, you know, the, 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 the counter to that might be because we're so desperate to get ourselves off Russian fossil fuels, yeah. we're keeping our you know, existing coal-powered plants going for longer and so on. So you could argue it both ways. Would anyone else towards the back of the room like to come in with any comment or question? Then I'm going to come back to Jan first, and then I've got one online. So I would like to move straight to questions. I know that we'll continue the discussion about the values, so I would like to return to economy, which will stay with us whether we want it or not. And uh, Christian, can you tell us a bit more Briefly, obviously, due to the time considerations about this, uh, this concept of basic income in Europe and how feasible this idea is, because so far only two countries are having a basic income notion. And what would be that income based on average median European value? Are we talking here about, I don't know, 2,000 euros, 4,000 euros? Can you give us any concrete numbers here? Brilliant. And then I have a question from online from Chris Burns, who's a journalist, um, why is it in the interest of EU youth for Ukraine to join the EU? There's an interesting question to make the case to EU youth for Ukraine joining the EU. So let's wrap up by going in reverse order. Marnie, you've had a moment to answer. Think of that question. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think I mean, I'm not an EU youth. However, um, I think something that is really interesting is, um, and is kind of coming up in a lot of these ideas is the future direction um, of youth or what they see their vision is, a lot of it is embedded in what their parents saw, those intergenerational legacies, and them not wanting to repeat some of these things. And so they saw, they understand what it was and they don't want to see this going forward. Uh, and seeing Ukraine, it's basically embodying or seeing exactly what they saw in their parents' lives, and they don't want to repeat that. And so I think there is significance for EU youth in this, I mean, any youth across the world is to help Ukraine, because I think we hear these things, we know these generational legacies exist, and I think we don't want that to happen again, and we don't believe in what we're seeing happening in Ukraine. We don't believe in mass atrocities, we don't believe in genocide, so therefore we want to help and we want to stop it, because I think we know that we can be better, and I think that's sort of where this connection lies, is that it's not just EU youth, I would say arguably youth across the world uh, want to do what they can, because we, we believe in something better for humanity, and we want to push for that. Terrific, Mani, that's great. Anna. Yeah, um, I could add to that, but since we're in yeah, short sure, time, go ahead. Yeah, um, no, I was just going to say that to me, uh, I had the question for a long time whether we would stand up for these values that have been so questioned and, and, and I don't know, ridiculed sometimes. You know, oh, you, you're, you're, uh, um, I don't know, your ideals and naive uh, ideals of what you know a society should uh, be like. And it was to see people, not just young Europeans, but people from all generations, going out on the streets, literally pressuring their governments to act and to provoke one of the fastest actions from the European Union. We've seen it in the whole of its history. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to share that impression. I was very <laughs> pleasantly surprised and relieved. To me, that was a relief to see that reaction. Uh, very quickly on your question, Lauda. Um, yeah, the same could be said uh, about the pandemic. So you were saying uh, how the Ukraine crisis kind of propelled action that was already uh, sought um, uh, after for a while. Um, and you could say the pandemic, in the, with the pandemic, we also saw that actually climate activists were pointing that out. Um, so there's no question now that we can't, we're capable of effective action. Um, I think the energy question, there is one side of it. It could go, um, you know, the way where we, we just become dependent on oil from other states and, by the way, authoritarian states as well. Uh, so there's a bit of hypocrisy there. Um, but there is also, I mean, uh, nuclear energy is, again, being debated perhaps more open-mindedly than it was. So, yeah, and I think also incentives for... Um, in, entrepreneurs and so on to come up with, with new solutions. Um, I probably will see more investment going into um, energy solutions and so on. So yeah, the effect of crisis is very powerful. Great. 
challenge and response. Christian. Yes, well, the case for EU enlargement has to be both idealistic and pragmatic. EU youth will benefit from the accession of many uh, other countries, including Ukraine, since trade relations are already, I mean, before the war, were very strong. Of course, the benefits from those relations would be even bigger if all countries are part of the same uh, union. Uh, in terms of the UBI question, um, it's a very expensive toy, definitely. Uh, we can talk about uh, basic income or universal basic income, so whether we want to uh, opt for the former, might be more politically and, and economically feasible. Um, and the role of the EU could at least be in, in uh, introducing and supporting uh, trials for UBI in specific member states, mm -hmm. even in specific towns, you know, in the sense that once, if we, from those trials we are able to um, identify the dynamics of, of UBI, for example, whether it would hurt um, employment, et cetera, et cetera. And then if, um, if we're happy with the results of those trials, it will then be for individual member states to actually think about introducing it. In any case, uh, the, the fight there is for uh, the very idea of a UBI or even for higher minimum wages for starters uh, in the EU member states uh, as a percentage of their average wage, not for one you know, specific amount that would apply to, to all countries. And, and just to the question of fact, has the EU supported any trials of UBI yet? So uh, in the case of Finland, uh, which is usually provided as the example of you know, uh, the first real UBI trial, uh, the EU was actually um, playing an obstructive role there. <laughs> I'm not an, an, an expert on, on the topic, but I, I know that some regulations actually um, contributed to the early um, conclusion of the trial. So if anything, the EU should try not to hinder future endeavors in that regard. Well, that, that's a very interesting recommendation. We have to close this panel. If those of you, if anyone has not uh, given us an interview on your European experience, your formative moment, what you want the EU to do by 2030, there's an amazing high-tech passport photo type of booth over here. It just takes five minutes, so we would really encourage you to record an interview, and indeed anyone who's online. Um, we will continue this conversation at um, 1.30 Brussels time, 1.30 p.m. Brussels time, Europe democratic and free, looking at democracy in the EU and its member states and at foreign and security policy and, of course, Ukraine. Um, but meanwhile, please join me in thanking our terrific panel.